that has been spoken already, bless in the Sunday school. And Father, bless us as we would consider the scriptures for a little while today, that it might speak to our hearts. Father, we realize that the moment that we have trusted Christ is simply the beginning of our life in God. We pray, Lord, that we might realize that every day that you give us is a day that has been given to us for a purpose, and that we might live for and serve our living Savior. Pray to watch over us today. Those that aren't with us, be with them, we pray. We ask these blessings and give thanks again for the Savior in his own precious name. Amen. Now about, um, I guess it was February, I had uh, started a message or started a, a series perhaps of, of messages, if I can put it that way. Um, that was a while ago. And you probably don't have a clue what I spoke on three months ago or so. But I'm just going to do a little bit of review, and uh, hopefully it'll come back to you. We may not finish uh, the, the um, materials today either. And so let's just take a, a minute or so for review. And uh, what I had begun with, the major, the overall heading for us, was the subject of the unchanging character of God. Now, you might say, well, that's sort of, uh, you might even think, well, I, you know, it, I, it's, it's a tough subject to get into. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that appeals to you. But actually, it's a, it's a subject that would be very thrilling and very encouraging because when we realize that we have been linked with this God, God in heaven, we realize that when it comes to him, nothing ever, ever, ha will, has, or can change. And so if we are linked with the God of heaven, then we are absolutely secure, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, uh, at least by way of review. There's a couple verses in that connection, and I hope these verses encourages, encourage us. You remember there was a day, um, and... His, his name was David, and David was in the city of Ziglag. And he was still not king. He had been anointed king, but he was not on the throne yet. And uh, there's a whole bunch of stories about this man, David. I know that. But uh, what happened was that he had gone out to battle with his men, at least two-thirds of his men he was with. And um, his wife, his wives, his children... The wives of all these men, they were all in this little city called Ziglag. Not only the people, but all their goods, everything they owned was there. Well, while David was out fighting, there were enemies, I believe it was the Amalekites, they came and they took every single person out of that city and every, every bit of their stuff. They didn't kill anyone, amazingly. So when the battle was over and they go back to the city to get their families and to get their things, no one's there. They're all gone. And the men that David had, uh, that had been with him in many, many battles, and who had gone and supported him, they were so angry, they were so frustrated, they were so upset, that amongst themselves at least, they started talking about, we're going to stone David to death. They were that upset. Now, he hadn't done anything personally to them, but it was just a, a, an outlet. This is what we're going to do because we're just so upset. And you know what happened to David? David didn't go run and hide in a cave again. What David did was this. First Samuel chapter 30, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. It's like Frank was talking about who do I resemble. I, I don't resemble David. Not in that situation, that's for sure. He encouraged himself in the midst of terrible difficulties. And again, we'll mention that. Uh, here's the verse, I am the Lord and I do not change. The very last book in our Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. In the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, we read these words. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13 and num uh, verse number 8. So I want to talk a little bit. I talked about this uh, at the conference, uh, at least in, 
uh, in part um, last weekend. But I want to talk about this idea of a foundation. Because in my private reading just this week, and in considering um, uh, ministry for today, I, I, I guess what's been in my heart, and this goes back to the character of God that we're speaking about, is the idea of, of this sense of insecurity that pervades our world. This sense of um, fear almost, this sense of impending doom that uh, seems to fill our society, fills our world, because we have seen so many things happen in such a short period of time, it's like, okay, when's the next foot going to fall? When's the next terrible thing going to happen? So there's this sense of, of uh, unease. Uh, maybe, maybe that's the least kind of thing that we can talk about. And I want to bring us back to the center. I want to bring us back. I want to bring my own heart back to this fact that I don't need to fear this because I am based, I am resting on the foundation that can never, ever be shaken. Um, that's, we've, we've been hearing just a few minutes ago about the, the value. That's a value that we can't quantify. Like, that means so very much. How many times have you heard, or maybe you've said, how many times have I heard over the last year or two years, what do people do without God? What do they do? How do they get through a day? How do they get through their life without God? He's ours. He's not just our God, but He is our Father, and I do not change, he says. And that's where we can rest. Simple definition of foundation. It's a body or a ground upon which something is built. And um, you say, well, that's really, really simple. It's really fundamental. And it is exactly fundamental. Oftentimes, a foundation isn't something that you can see, especially when it comes to buildings, whether it's commercial or homes, whatever the case may be. It's a basis upon which something stands or is supported. The basis of a, a tenet, an idea, if you will, a principle or an axiom, something that someone has said. And I want you just to think very briefly, I'm going to concentrate mostly on the last one, about the foundation of three different things. The foundation of the soul. We have just been hearing the gospel. And when we stop and think about the gospel. When we think about, I'm just going to use the story that we have just heard about a man named Jesus who went to a cross, who died a horrible death, physically, naturally speaking, and who died in kinds of horror that I don't know how to describe spiritually. And I trust him. Now, does that sound rational? Does that sound normal, to use the term that you hear about, hear so much about. No, it doesn't sound rational, naturally speaking. But this is the man that we trust. This is the man, and this is why we trust. First of all, he is God. First of all, we have the word of God. And second of all, we have the word of God. And thirdly, now he's alive. This man who had the power over death, hell, sin, and the grave is alive. He lives in the power of an endless life. And we can all say, that is my God, that is my Savior. The foundation of the soul. Paul writes to first, in 1 first Corinthians chapter 3, he says, other foundation can no one lay than Jesus Christ. And everything else in my life, as a Christian, goes from there and, of course, then he gives a warning about building on that foundation, the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The foundation of joy. Um, let me just, as a side note, sometimes um, we misconstrue or we mix up happiness and joy. Oh, I just want my family to be happy. I want my children to be happy. I want my grandchildren to be happy. Happy, happy, happy. I remember, uh, I've forgotten his name, but there was a, a Russian man. Uh, if it comes to anyone's mind, 
go ahead and speak it out, but he ministered one time uh, after he was, he was very broken in his English, and uh, he, I, think, I think I can remember the three points he had. And he said, we should be happy people. We should always be happy people. And we should never be unhappy people. <laughs> that was his three, three points. Of, but I'll tell you what, I still haven't forgotten it. And he's been dead a long time. And, uh, but those three points, although they're so very simple. But is, are, are we talking about happiness or are we talking about joy? And there's a big difference. God never really promises us. He never really encourages us to make other people happy. Happy changes, doesn't it? It changes with the weather. It changes with uh, what side of the bed I wake up on every day. It changes with emotions. It changes with circumstances. It always changes. It's up and down. And as parents, as grandparents, we're never encouraged, we're never exhorted to do things in our life to make our children happy. Never! We're to raise them in the fear, like that's a lot different than happy, in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. We're to honor God in raising our children because they are given to us as gifts. They are given to us as stewardship. So what is this thing called joy? Why is it different? Because it's not affected by all those things. And the foundation of our joy isn't in our circumstances. It isn't in how we feel. It is in the facts of who we are in Christ. That's what brings us joy. Um, we talked about the Apostle Paul recently just in our Bible studies when we talk about all the things he suffered. And if you don't remember what those things are, just go to 2 Corinthians and chapter 12. And Paul will tell you exactly what happened to him. How many times he was stoned. How many times he was beaten. How many times he was left overnight in the water. All those various things. Was he a man filled with joy? He was. Was he happy? I don't know. Was he hurting? I'm sure he was. The one time they left him for dead. They stoned him and they thought, well, he's done for. We can leave him. And they walked away and he got up and kept on preaching. That's the kind of man he was. He was a man that was filled with joy. Even in the middle of our circumstances, and that's why I mentioned David earlier, we can have joy. The last one um, that I want you to think about, these three items, the foundation of convictions, principle, and practice that is what I want to spend uh, the remaining time that I have. And that is based on biblical truth. One of the things that I emphasized, and I will emphasize it as long as I have breath, first of all, this direction, and for any, of the, any child of God, one of the things I would emphasize is knowing biblical truth. And that doesn't come by osmosis. I figured that out. You can't put your Bible under your pillow and hope that during the night something's going to seep in. It doesn't work that way. It takes work. It takes work. Now, um, all of us either are in or have been in school. And uh, we talk about the study, studying in class. We talk about homework. We talk about studying a particular subject. We, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the reason we do that is so that we can learn the truth. We want to learn the theorems when it comes to mathematics, when it comes to trigonometry. We need to learn them. We need to take what's on that page or what's on the screen and put it in here. Put it in here. That, that needs to be the foundation. We need to get that if we're going to understand these other three things that are listed there. The principles of my life, the convictions that I have, they all come from learning and bringing into my experience the truth of the Bible. I know I've mentioned this before, but um, I had talked a number of years ago to two young men in their mid-30s, very successful in their business, 
And they had, uh, it had to do with the, the subject of God's assembly at the time. But they had decided that they were seriously considering leaving God's assembly. I was thinking just before I got up here that, in a sense, um, speaking to this audience that's here, and I don't know who else might be listening, but um, it might be preaching or preaching to the choir. And that's okay, because we need to have this reminder. I'm so very thankful for that truth, that fact remaining established in the assembly here in Vandegrift. And I pray to God that it never, ever changes. Because, brethren and sisters, could I very sadly and solemnly warn you, it's changing in a lot of places. Well, there's this subject of, uh, I'll just leave it at that, there's a subject that um, people have questioned, people have wondered about. And so, um, but this is what the Word of God says. Well, yeah, but maybe that was culture. Maybe that was the... The, 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 you know, it was just what was happening at the time. And, and the circumstances were such, or, um, let's vote on it. That's exactly what they did. And they did that. No, that's, that's passe. I mean, if you really want to, okay, that's fine with you. But for anyone who doesn't want to, that's fine with you. And is that truth? Truth that never, ever changes. Truth that is not dependent on what I think at all. Truth that doesn't depend on time. Is that truth? And now, just to carry that just a little bit further, just for you to mull over, to think upon, if that is subject to progressive thinking, that's the term that's often used, if it's subject to progressive thinking, what else is? What else that I have thought was foundational in its truth is just, you know, well, that was for them and that was for, for then and now it's me and us and now it's 2022 and I think you get my point. I hope you get my point. Based on biblical truth. There's a question asked in the Psalms it's really a sad question. It's really a solemn question. And the question is, and I will disclaim it this way, that, mm, that's not necessarily the, uh, the context, if you read the whole psalm. But the question still demands at least our thoughts, our, our question. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If... If the foundation, the things that I've been standing on, the things that I would stand on to the death, if you will, if they're changed, if they're destroyed, then what do I do? What do I stand? Forget it all. Walk away from it. And that's what's happened. Now, I know Brother Paul and probably a lot of us, um, this is obvious enough if we went and we were looking at a, a house or a building and that's what we saw, there would immediately be questions in our mind. And those questions, they are a result of a fundamental problem. There's something very obvious. Things aren't, things aren't intact. There's a big crack. Things are slightly tilted and so on. And as a result of what we see, regarding a fundamental situation, there's uncertainty, there's fear, and there's danger. And that same thinking enters into my life. Remember, Paul says there's a foundation that's been laid, and now I'm building on that foundation. Uh, probably one of my favorite psalms and uh, I know my brother Matt has spent a lot of time over the last number of months in the Psalms. Because I love to hear them quoted. But there's a uh, man by the name of Asaph. Sometimes when we think of the Psalms, we think, oh, those are all the Psalms of David. No, they're not. Uh, a lot of them are. And uh, they are in particular situations where things are happening in David's life. They're in situations where he has sinned. He has he has faltered and he's confessing his sin to God. There's times where he's scared. But um, I want you to think about Asaph, who wrote 
Psalm number 73. I want to read a few verses. I want you, you can turn to it if you like, but um, I want you to listen really careful to what he said. At the very beginning of the chapter, Psalm 73, he says, Truly God is good to Israel and to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, and that's where this verse is right now, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. And then he goes on and he's talking about what he's seeing. He's seeing wicked people doing really good. He's seeing wicked people get rich. And he can't figure it out. It comes down to verse number 16 in Psalm 73 and he says this. So I tried to understand why. Why the wicked prosper. What a difficult task it is. Then, he said, then. He got his act together, didn't he? Then I went into your sanctuary, O oh God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. You probably are fairly familiar with those verses. Go down to verse number 22, and it says this. Here's, here's Asaph, and it's almost like he's um, taking what he's been thinking, taking the emotions of his heart and pouring them out on a page. Verse 22 says, I was so foolish and ignorant. I must have seemed like a senseless, senseless animal to you. He's talking to God. He says this, yet I still belong to you. With all of my mental wanderings and meanderings, I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. Down a little further, God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. And down at the end, down to verse 28, but as for me, how good it is to be near God. How good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. Now this, this man, Asaph, he says, I was this close. Um, interestingly, the King James says, my feet were almost gone. Now that doesn't mean his feet were almost gone. But he was right at the edge of the precipice. He was so very close to stepping off what he knew was right. Stepping away from the foundations that he knew were God's foundations, that he knew were God's truth. He was so close, thank God, that he didn't fall. Just by way of illustration, we're all familiar with, uh, with that place. I think we are. Um, if you um, have never seen that place, you probably have seen this old advertisement. And uh, it uses the Rock of Gibraltar. And if you have any question about how big that thing is, that's an airport at the base of it. It's a city at the base of it. It's a really big rock. And so that particular insurance company says, get a piece of the rock uh, because it's so secure. It's not going to fail. It's, it's really a foundational uh, truth. I was thinking this was actually just, uh, just last night. I was thinking of this place. And all of us are familiar with those two towers. And, of course, that's the picture of the two towers in New York City pre-9-11. 2001. On your left, of course, are the Twin Towers. But uh, the reason I put that up there is to show you um, this building right here. Okay? Anyone know what that is? Empire State Building. That's exactly right. You say, what's that have to do with anything? Well, of course, we know what happened on 9-11. And uh, for many of us, those pictures are burned into our memories. They will never leave. When the planes flew into the Twin Towers, you can see the Twin Towers on fire. And not only were, was that horrific fire happening, but you remember, and that's what sticks in my mind even more than watching the planes, was when those things began to shake. And then they crashed to the ground, 110 stories crashed to the ground in Manhattan. So what? What's that have to do with the Empire State Building? 
Well, if you do any reading on um, that day and the events of that day, you find out that um, the Twin Towers weren't the only buildings that came down. Not just that day and at those moments, but over the next weeks and months, other buildings came down because they had to be torn down because of the concussion of those hundreds of thousands of tons of debris coming down and reverberating on the earth. And it, what it do? It shook the foundations of the buildings to such an extent that they were destroyed, they were damaged beyond repair, they had to be destroyed. But in March of 1930, there was a crew that arrived at that intersection in Manhattan, where the Empire State Building is, and they began to dig. And they dug, and they dug, and they dug for months. They dug 55 feet straight down until they reached bedrock. And then, and only then, did they begin to erect a very, very well-known Empire State Building. And when the events happened on that day, that terrible day, the attack on America, there wasn't so much as a tiny little crack in the Empire State Building. Just a little bit of an illustration about it's really, really important what we rest on. And we rest on a living God. We rest on a living God. In contrast to that, I think all of us at some point or another, we've been to the shore. And, uh, you know, some, sometimes it's not just like this, but um, you go to the shore and the waves are rolling. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I like to go in part way, maybe up to my knees, and the waves are crashing, and you do one of these. They're like, okay, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to plant my feet here, and nothing's going to move me. Well, you know how well that goes. And it doesn't take very long before um, maybe the waves itself don't move you, but what happens is those waves come underneath, and take away what you're standing on. And you got to move. Or you'll fall down. Which happened plenty enough. So it's very, it's very, very critical what we stand on. So this idea of the unchanging character of God is based, when it comes to God, it's based on His Word, God's truth, and the singularity of it, the foundation of God's Word. We're going to read a couple of verses together, and I know our time's going very quickly. That's okay. We'll maybe come back to it three months from now. But anyway, um, I want you to think about the fact that when we read the Scriptures, we're reading the gold standard. There's nothing better. There's nothing stronger. There's nothing more eternal than the Word of God. And is that not why Jesus said, and we read about it in the various Gospels, He said, heaven and earth will pass away. Everything we know is going to crumble. You remember when he's describing the end times, even the rock of Gibraltar, those rocks, those mountains will be leveled. They'll crumble, they'll crash, they'll fall. The valleys will be filled. Everything is going to be on an even plane. All of that is going to happen. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word, never, never. It's a very dramatic word, emphatic word. Never, never pass away. Um, how many times have people said to you, how do you know for sure? I mean, sorry. It doesn't reside in me. My joy, my confidence, my assurance, my peace isn't something I work up in here. It's like, what, what do we read in Hebrews chapter 6? Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul and where does that anchor attach? It's anchored in Jesus Christ who has entered in already. That's where it's attached. That's where we're anchored. What a tremendous truth. And of course, you're familiar with these words. I'm pretty sure you are familiar with these words. God, who cannot lie, has promised. That's where we rest. That's our foundation. And uh, many of us, or most of us, all of us I trust, we're, we're, when it comes to our souls, we're at absolute peace about that. I rest on what Jesus has said, what he has promised. I rest there 
nothing can shake that. No matter what happens, I rest there. Then how come? How come we change? I'm not saying anything to anybody here, but how come, why is it that, that people change? Well, if you rest on the Word of God, then why don't you rest on the Word of God for everything? Everything. At the very end of our Bible, of course, there's a condemnation, there's really a curse for anyone who adds to or subtracts from the Word of God. God has given to us His Word in its completeness. Now, again, for somebody who is extremely hungry, maybe someone who is starving to death, there they are, they're sitting at the, at the table, they're, they're hours away from dying of starvation, and, and you put something in front of them, you put a delicious meal, you put something that they could even take in, a milkshake or something like that, and they look at it and they, you know, they just, oh, that's so wonderful, that's so beautiful, I, that, that's exactly what I need, and there it sits. And they're going to be dead with it sitting right in front of them. Now, that's what sinners will often do with the gospel, the message of the gospel, but that's what we do, too. When we don't take all of the Word of God in its context and apply it to our lives as, uh, 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 in a practical sense, as far as living our lives before others, as far as spreading the gospel, but as far as God's assembly is concerned. He has given to us exactly, not too much, not too little, of what we need. That's why Peter writes that it was the Spirit of God that breathed into the authors of our Bibles the truth that he wants us to know. And we need to imbibe it, to learn it, and then to put it into practice and to hold to it, standing firm. There's a, one of David's mighty men in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel, or in 2 Samuel, I believe it is, um, He's being attacked by the Philistines. His name is Shammah. He's one of David's 30 mighty men. And he's being attacked. And if, if we were to come on the scene, we would see a man standing in the middle of a field. And in that field, it's a field of lentils. I guess that's like beans, right? And he's got a sword out. It's like, Shammah, how comes your... How comes you're taking your life in your hand and fighting for a field of beans? Now, if we could ask him something like that, he would say, because this field is my inheritance. I stand here. God has given, this is divinely given to me by God. I stand here and defend it because God has given me an inheritance. Oh, that makes a totally different picture, doesn't it? It, it? it shows a different side of why one of David's mighty, mightiest men would stand in the middle of a field with a sword drawn. And he defended it, and he fought off and killed the enemy. Just, it's just sort of one of those little... Sometimes you read all the stories of all the names, and all, it's like, oh, it gets really, really laborious. But every so often you see a little tidbit like that. It's like, okay... That's why he was doing that. That's why God took the time to mention that little name and just those set of circumstances. I think it's two verses, maybe. And God gives us those kinds of things to encourage us in the little things. Now, he wasn't fighting a great big giant. He was just fighting for a field of beans. But God gave it to him. And, of course, that enters into the whole subject of uh, our stewardship. So the idea of truth, um, and the truth of the Word of God, as I have already tried to emphasize just a little bit, is, is the, the, the crux. Um, John, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, we read about the Lord Jesus, that uh, this man that he is describing, this person who is presented as the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was full of two things. And we're thankful for both of them. He was full of grace. 
There was no one that showed more grace than the Lord Jesus. I mean, Frank just preached about it. Imagine him standing in front of his accusers, being told three times publicly before crowds of people, he's innocent. He hasn't done one thing wrong. And of course, he's condemned to death. Never spoke a word. Full of grace, full of mercy. But it says he was filled with grace and truth. Grace and truth. Um, many years ago, the early 90s actually, and some of you may remember, but many years ago there was um, an assembly in Punxsutawney. Maybe you did or maybe you didn't know that, I'm not sure, but the Elk Run Gospel Hall. And if you ever know anything about Punxsutawney, on the main drag there's a, a sheet store and right across the street is this little tiny abandoned building um, and it still has the sign up. I remember going there in, uh, in 91, that's when it was, 91, 92 in that area. John and I met with uh, um, uh, Charles Weinberg, was his name. And uh, we got talking about the assembly in the past, the history, spoke of different preachers that had been there and the, the assembly the way it was. And at the time that we met him, he was there with, with his two sisters, two blood sisters, and himself, that was the assembly. That's all there were. You know what he said? He said, we made a mistake a long time ago. And he, he used the word, we didn't. He said, we compromised. And we're paying for it now. We compromised. Compromise what? Compromise truth. And now we're paying for it. And that's the, that's the fear, that's the danger that we can enter into if we're not very, very careful. We need to never compromise truth. Paul, you know, that he wrote to, especially two young men, wrote to assemblies, he wrote to, to Philemon, he wrote to two young men, Timothy and Titus. And in writing to, to Titus, he says this in, in the very first chapter, I believe it is, um, speaking about those that had the responsibility in an assembly, those that were teachers. And he writes it, writes it this way, he must hold firm. Now, yeah, I have to remember that some of the, the way the words, some of the way the verses are written, you have to remember they didn't have anything in writing. They didn't have a New Testament. Some of the churches by that time, they had some letters that Paul had written, which we now have as books in our Bible. But uh, remember when he writes to the Colossian Christians, he says, oh, by the way, make sure you give a copy of this letter to the church at Laodicea. That's all they had. They, and, and most of the time, we've been talking about this in our Bible study, which I have immensely enjoyed, by the way. Um, just a, a wonderful little assembly that grew so fast and, and stayed so strong in spite of the fact that they didn't have anything. They had, at a max, two and a half months about three weeks to two and a half months was all that they had of, of this man Paul preaching to them, teaching them, teaching the doctrines that God had given to him. So in writing to, writing to, um, to Titus, he says, this trustworthy word as taught, not as written, because it, it was just being written then, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. Instruction in sound doctrine also to rebuke those who contradict it. So for all of us, the challenge is we need to know why we know. You've used the phrase, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, he doesn't or she doesn't know what they don't know. And you stop and think about it, yeah, that's right. And that's why it's so important for us to know what we know or to know what we say, to know what we present, to know what we teach. And Paul is saying to this young man, Titus, Look, there's a whole bunch of garbage out there. And could I say that this way here now today? There's a whole bunch of garbage out there. If we get out on the internet, and there's a lot of good things there, as, uh, as you well know and likely have all of us have used, there's um, a lot that's out there, but it's like, okay, I want to study this bit of theology, whatever the case is. Um, so I go out there and say, okay, well, so-and-so says this. Well, hmm. well, you know, Google says it, so it must be right, you know. So you say, we wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, we would and do. 
Be very, very careful what you read. And we mentioned this just in our Bible study, and I would emphasize it again. You remember that when Paul went to Philippi, you know what happened there. He ended up in prison, and of course he is he's booted out of Philippi, and the next place he goes is to Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, he preaches. There's an assembly in Philippi. There's an assembly in Thessalonica. And at the time, the, the Thessalonian believers listened. And there were some other people who listened. And they were called the Bereans. And the Bereans, listening, they took it in. Maybe they said amen. I don't know what they did. But I do know this, that after they went home, they said, now, yeah, we know that was Paul. We know that he's a, he's a great teacher, great preacher, and so on and so forth, but let's make sure Paul's right. Make sure Paul's right? Yeah, let's make sure Paul's right. So what they did is they took the scriptures they had and searched them to see if he was right. Do we do that with everything we hear? And there's some really nice stuff out there. Very appealing stuff out there. It might be videos, it might be books, it might be lectures, it might be YouTubes, whatever the case may be. And I'm not decrying any of them. I'm just saying this. Some of them I have listened to. Some of them I have watched. Some of them I have read. And sorry, but they're wrong. It's like what Paul reminded the Ephesian Christians. He said, or to, to the elders before he left them, and he never saw them again, he said, I want you to be careful. I want you to beware because there are going to be those right in your very midst and what they're going to do is they're going to rise up and they're going to start to teach twisted things. And we're going to take the truth but we're going to twist it. And I don't know, is that just human nature? That's the stuff we imbibe. That's the stuff we grab onto, the twisted stuff. The demented stuff. And what it does, it's like the ocean when you're standing on the sand and it just washes things out from underneath us. And so the question the psalmist asked if the foundations are destroyed. What will we do? We need to get back to the foundation. We need to get back to the word of God. I had said I was in my regular reading and I'm going to end with this. There were just a couple phrases I want to pull out just for you to think about in connection with what we've talked about. In 1 Corinthians 14, there's just some phrases. The very first words of the chapter are pursue love. Now, these are all foundational things. Pursue love. I'm just going to pull them out as I go down. The end of verse number 12, strive to excel in building up the saints. Foundational. Foundational teaching. Um... Verse number 20, in your thinking, be mature. Verse 26, each one, God has given to each one, and let all things be done for building up. For God is not a God of confusion, but he is a God of peace. Now, in many ways, we've just, you know, sort of just skimmed the surface again of this idea of sound doctrine and maybe some of you, or may oftentimes, if not now, or not yet, it will come. There's always this that comes up. But what about? But what about? Well, I've got to leave it there, because my time's up. And I want you just to think, just very, very carefully. Think about the truth of the foundation that God has given to us. He's he hasn't said, well, I'm going to give him this much, and then they're on earth for there, for, from there. He, he doesn't do that. That's not the way God works. He does everything completely. He finishes things. Now, for all of us as Christians, he's finishing us. We're in finishing school, day by day in our life. But may God help us to latch on to and to stand firm on. We didn't read any of those verses where we're given that exhortation to stand firm on the truth of the word of God. Lord, we're so thankful that we have your word. And no matter where we are, and no matter what our circumstances, we're thankful that your word never, ever changes. Your word is as eternal and unchanging as is our God.
Father, we pray that we might find great peace and security and joy in that truth. Father, help us all to be students of the scriptures in our own little uh, sphere, our own little venues. And our Father, that we might find that joy that only comes with resting in our God. Thank you for saving us. Pray to bless the assembly. Preserve it, O God. There are so many enemies. We pray that it might be preserved. Bless the word spoken to the children as well. Watch over us today. We're thankful for all you've given to us. We're thankful for answers to prayer as we were considering earlier today. And ask, Father, that you would continue to encourage our hearts. Remember us in view of the VBS coming up. We ask your blessing upon